Hi, and welcome to APO's American Armenian Health Professionals Organization's TV Health Program. Today's topic is headache. Headache is a very common ailment that affects many people and certain times can be very disabling. To review the headache, types of headache, and the recent treatments, we have invited Dr. Elis Agopian. She's board certified in neurology, and he's part of, she's part of Northwell Health, and the locations are Great Neck and Forest Hills. Dr. Agopian, welcome to our program. Thank you. So we have, the topic is headache, obviously. As a primary care physician, I see a lot of headaches in the office, many types of headaches we have. As a neurologist, I'm sure you get a lot of referrals for the headaches. Absolutely. So let's uh, start with the types of headaches. Let's, let's talk about the types of headaches that we, we see in the office that you get referral for. Well, the most important thing to consider is first, is this a headache um, that's caused just because of a neurological problem or is this a secondary headache caused by a medical problem? Right. So the neuro let's, let's take primary headaches first, the simple headaches to, to talk about. Let's talk about the tension headache, and then we'll go to cluster headache. So a tension headache is probably one of the most common headaches, and it's usually a headache that's uh, experienced by many people. It's experienced as pressure pain, usually with, associated with neck tension and pressure in the head. It's usually generalized headache, and it's a um, mild to moderate headache. And probably uh, towards the end of the day, after the, being tired or so? Um, or it can come at any time? It could come at any time, but it's certainly associated mostly with stress. What a physical or emotional stress could right. exacerbate that headache. Right. It usually is not associated with nausea and vomiting, any no. other symptoms? No. No, that would be more of a feature of a migraine headache. headache. Right. Then we have cluster type of headaches, so which uh, people experience different symptoms. Can you go over the cluster type of symptoms? Sure, in cluster headaches even we have different features, but the most common feature in cluster headache is autonomic features. And autonomic, autonomic features would mean that there is usually severe unilateral uh, pain associated with um, eye, eye pain as well as, uh, as nasal discharge, sometimes tearing of the eye and redness of the eye. And the duration of the headaches are different. Also the headaches actually are experienced more frequently with men. What kind of treatment do you usually recommend for that kind of headache? It really depends on the type of cluster headache because the duration of the headache does lead the type and the duration uh, in, of the medication. Um, but mostly we start with abortive therapy for uh -huh. cluster headaches. And uh, if, you, if a patient comes to the hospital, just simple uh, three liters of oxygen could abort the headache. Right. So that's so very encouraging. So if they're not really in the hospital or emergency room, oxygen is the best treatment. <laughs> yes. Uh, of course, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. In that case, we need to have patients on preventive treatments such as calcium channel blockers mm -hmm. or Lamicto uh, as an example of medication. How about the uh, migraine headache? That's the main topic I like to discuss because there are so many types of migraine headaches, actually. A typical, typical migraine headaches. Let's talk about the general in migraine headache. Um, so migraine headaches there are perhaps the most common headaches after tension headaches. And they're more common in women, actually. And usually start in teenage years and early 20s, 30s, and remit in their 30s and 40s, and get worse in usually 50s. Um, migraine headaches actually are very different from each other, too, and everyone could experience pain very differently. But usually it's mostly throbbing pain. And it could be either unilateral throbbing pain, meaning on one side of the head, or it could be on both sides of the head. And then presenting symptoms usually for different for different people, right? Some people, the aura, what we call, might have, they might not have. Absolutely. So some people do have a warning sign, and we call that an aura. And some people do not. Uh, usually auras come in very different flavors. It could be some people feel tired, some people feel dizzy, some people feel that their vision is blurry or they lose vision, but the most common symptom that would come in terms of an aura is usually flashing lights. And then how about the nausea? That's usually people that I get in the office, mainly they say nausea, and sometimes when I use anti-nausea medication to abort, it works sometimes, but not all the time, obviously. So the nausea is a feature usually when the migraine is actually in full-blown capacity. That means that uh, the aura has started, there's an aura, and the patient has developed a headache, and it's usually a headache, so it's a severe headache uh, that encompass the, in, makes the patient incapable of uh, continuing their daily activities. At that point, they develop light sensitivity, noise sensitivity in some cases, and they could also have nausea as well as vomiting. Right. Do we have a recommendation to them something to do to abort them right away, if possible? 
So again, that has to be taken within the context mm -hmm. of the specific patient uh, because there is such a difference in terms of the actual mi migraines that's uh, uh, associated with patients. In people who actually have just very simple migraine, usually if they take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, like Advil, let's such say, as or Advil, Aleve, Aleve Excedrin, mm -hmm. um, Naproxen, right. people, if they take it early on, either when the actual aura starts, the warning sign starts, or if they don't have one early when the headache starts, uh, then they're actually capable of so stopping the, the headache problem. very mm -hmm. quickly. Right. So who, which patient group we should say we would really recommend them preventive medicine because they are getting soft and then it's definitely a kind of a uh, couple times a week or so sometimes um, even not related with the period or so what they have. So usually patients who have headaches about four times a month, they could manage the headaches very well when they use actually abortive therapy. Mm -hmm. And the nosteroidal anti-inflammatory is one type of abortive therapy. A tryptan medic medication such as Maxo, for example, is another common medication that works very well. But if patients develop headaches that are more common, usually more than four times a week, mm -hmm. that's a good sign that a preventive medication may be warranted. Right. What kind of medication? What kind of... Uh, category of medication we use for prevention for them. That's the a very good. Channel blockers, uh, some anti-seizure medications. It's a very good question. You have to there's first line medications that we know work very well, mm -hmm. and there's second line medication, there's third line medications, of course, as well. Uh, usually, the most common medications they used are usually antidepressants or uh, what we typically what we typically know of antidepressants such as amitriptyline or triptyline. Which is or, an old medication actually we use for yes. depression in the past a lot. Yes. Or other medications such as uh, typically developed procedures such as topiramide or topamax. Although again those are medications while developed for the treatment of seizures. What dosages we use for um, seizure or what dosages are for migraine I think let's say and what are the side effects? The doses we used uh, for headache prevention, for migraine prevention, are much smaller than the doses that are used for seizure, med uh, for seizure prevention. Right. Sometimes in the past when we were in teaching or so, we would say any headache that wakes you up middle of the night, that would be a little worrisome. Would you still go with that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's certainly a headache that wakes you up at night, especially in an older person. The, one, the first thing you want to do is an MRI. At that right. point, you're really worried about a headache that, that's a sign of an intracranial process, such as either primary brain cancer or metastasis in right. the brain. So really, when we, when we think about the secondary headaches, then we are thinking about some sort of either primary tumor or some other tumors that came from other part of the body to the brain causing the headache per se. Primary brain tumor or a metastasis from other sores uh, is the thing you worry about the most, but also there's vascular headaches that one would worry about, and specifically would be that subarachnoid headache uh, that really could be very deadly. It would be a headache that starts and becomes severe within seconds. Right. It's, it's really associated. So we're not talking about tumor this time, we're talking about a little bleeding in the brain and different part of the brain, which we call subarachnoid section, and that can be really uh, excruciating pain. And sometimes stroke can come in and bleeding can come in. It's a mild headache, but it can be there. It could be, certainly a stroke, if it's in the right location, it could mm -hmm. cause a headache, but that's not really as common as it is a subarachnoid hemorrhage or hemorrhage in general. When we talk about secondary tumors, I mean secondary headaches, then we're talking about the tumors, we're talking about bleeding in the brain, mm -hmm. but thankfully these are not that common that when yes, we have, absolutely. so we don't want everybody to think that, oh, I have a tumor, brain tumor, now I have a headache. So that it's not really common, common ones, but it's there. It and is the certainly there. And the most bad. significant, I think, symptoms, we should say, waking up at night and a headache being excruciating and not letting go. Well, certainly um, waking up at night or a headache that's a really severe headache that starts all of a sudden would be the two most worrisome headache. But in an older person, it's really a headache that's a new headache that's most worrisome. Right. For example, someone who is in their 50s, they've never had headaches before, and all of a sudden they're developing new headaches. Right. That should warrant a warning sign that something needs to be worked right. at. Dr. Agopian, thank you very much for coming to thank our you. program. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for having me. us about the headache. Now it's time for this week's article. It is about flavonoid intake and age-related decline in lung function. Lung function starts to decline in third decade of life, but different rates of decline across individuals. Lower lung function is a strong predictor of mortality and has been associated with increased risk of hospitalizations. 
diet rich in antioxidant and also different flavonoid subclasses like dietary anthocyanins are positively related to slower age-related decline in lung function. Anthocyanins are derived from fruits, predominantly from berries like blueberries and strawberries, and they have been shown to be associated with low risk of hypertension and heart disease by decreasing oxidative stress, DNA damage, and inflammation. Dr. Amar Mehta and his colleagues from VA Research Center in Boston, Massachusetts, investigated whether different flavonoid subclasses present in our diet were associated with beneficial effect in lung function over the time. 839 participants were followed between 1992 and 2008. Periodically, their lung functions and their dietary intake of flavonoids were measured. They found strong inverse association, 37% less decline between anthocyanin intake and age-related decline in lung function, independent of dietary and non-dietary risk factors like smoking. The protective association of anthocyanins were present in both current, former, and never smokers. Conclusion of this study is, age-related decline in lung function can be attenuated with higher dietary intake of anthocyanins like blueberries and strawberries. So how much blueberry and strawberry for protection? You need more than two servings, two cups a week for your lung protection. If you are a smoker, quit smoking and eat your berries for your lung protection and longevity. Good health is precious and priceless. Keep informed by visiting APO's website, aahpo.org. I'm Dr. Ohan Karadoprak. Until next program, so long.